Hello and welcome to GEA Embedded, our weekly GEA show here on Balls.ie, where every Monday we look back on the best of the GEA action from the weekend. Now, an amazing weekend it was, really. We're down to just six teams in the football championship, six teams in the hurling championship. Dublin are the only team left in a chance of doing the double. It was a terrible weekend for Galway. And Mayo and um, Kerry laid down markers in the football championship. We're going to talk about all that and lots more. We'll have Shane McGrath, wait, he's standing by. He's going to talk to us about the hurling in a couple of minutes. Um, up next, though, we're going to speak to Darren O'Sullivan. Just to mention as well, though, we will be guessing the handicaps for next weekend with um, with PJ and Gary a little bit later on. And Finch is going to be bringing us, looking at the best GA sponsors of all time. And I know he's left out a couple here that I have to have words with him about, but we'll get to them in a few minutes. But... What a football weekend it was. Kerry, 22-point winners over Cork in the Munster final. Mayo, an amazing second-half performance to win the first-ever Connacht final played at Crow Park. Darren O'Sullivan is with us now. Darren, how are you doing? Not too bad, mate. How's it going? Not too bad, no, not too bad. Uh, Kerry, I, I suppose I turned it on at one stage and I actually missed the first few minutes in between games. I had to bring my little girl out for a little bit of walk out in the air. And I just, I came back in and literally Brian Hurley was putting the ball in the net and it was 1-5 to three points. And from there on in, Kerry won the game 4-19 to four points. Um, like, we'll talk about Cork and we really do have to. But as a Kerry... You know, we've been talking all year about the progression um, of Kerry and that how they'll be happy with how things are going and how they have stepped things up. But, you know, to fall behind and to react that way, regardless of whether it was probably too easy a run out for what they'll expect when they get to the All-Ireland, um, when they get to the All-Ireland semi-final against uh, Tyrone or Monaghan in a couple of weeks, you have to be pleased with the fact that when they needed to turn it on, they could. Yeah, look, I suppose, especially the way they started, they started so slow. Um the decision making was off and in fairness them they did regroup um i think a lot of that comes down to i think car ran out of steam very early um so look you have to look at the positives they uh they regrouped they started making better decisions i think that was killing them in the first 15 20 minutes up in the forwards i i know from being a foreign player they would have had in their head that they this is a chance to make it make it right after last year and it just seemed that they wanted to get goals very early and just kill off the game and build up a big score. And it just wasn't happening. Cork were tenacious. They were hungry. They were tearing into them. All of a sudden, Kerry were falling further and further behind. Um, but so, yeah, look, it was a good sign of maturity that they just, they regrouped and they started doing the simple things um, a lot better. Yeah, absolutely. When you look, like, it's funny when, when they were, as they were doing that, I thought one player in particular, I think you might have mentioned this on, on, on Twitter last night, but he went on to have such a good game in the dominance. But when, Paddy Clifford really steadied things as well, didn't he? And kind of got in for a couple of those scores that were really important at the time when Kerry just needed to calm things down a little bit. Yeah, hundred percent. When when things weren't going well, there were two players for me that were standing out. One was Brian Begley. Yeah, um, he was the tightest of the backs. He was making great turnovers at the time. And then Paddy. Paddy was getting on ball. He's an extremely good team player. But when they needed someone to break the lines, he was the fella who was doing the little drop of the shoulder and going by and chipping in with a little point here, a point here. I think he had two points of our first six or so. Mm. But he was the only one that was actually getting by the man and drawing another man and being able to slip it. Whereas other fellas weren't um, getting the same kind of joy. They were getting double team, the treble team. Paddy had, uh, I suppose he was elusive and he was getting away from fellas. So the best sign, the best sign for me of Paddy so far is when Kerry were not going well, he was the guy carrying the fight and still doing the right things at the right time. So that was very uh, pleasing from, from the outside because, look, obviously we're very reliant on the likes of David Clifford and Shawnee. Mm. And when, when they were a bit quieter, he stood up, which is a great sign. Absolutely, yeah, and it, like again, when you consider the forward line he's walking into to play in the way he's done so far this year is unbelievable, and we'll talk about some of the rest of the performances as well. But I just actually just want to talk about Cork for a few minutes and just where they go from here. Looking at looking back on some stats, this is a horrible one for Cork. It's the second biggest Munster final winning margin of all time, uh, twenty two points. I had to go all the way back to nineteen nineteen for a twenty three point win by Kerry over Clare, six eleven to two goals. Uh, I also found one in 1931 was a 21-point win for Kerry, 5-8 to 6 to 2 points against Tip. So that's yeah. kind of the eras we're talking about when there was more goals than points and so on and yeah. so forth. 
22 points and it could have been more like i mean even you know kerry were pulling up a little bit at the end and Cork yeah had a of- yeah that's i think that's the worst thing about it um like i said it to you last week i said i can't see anything i think kerry went comfortably mm. and i was fairly vocal about it down here in ross point uh the last couple of weeks too because we have a big car contingent i was there like i just can't see anything other than a big kerry win um but it's just no good it's no good for kerry it's no good for cork all i was getting done yesterday was ah sure we're a hurling county but they're not doing the business at hurling either so um i think they need a, a big regroup they need to overhaul the whole thing because it's just not right um you know as uh, looked was great to win but you get no you get no enjoyment in that like genius i look back to the the games i was involved in with cork there were battles Ten battles are gone. The only bit of a battle we got yesterday was 15 minutes and then it, it just died out. Um, they're getting underage success, under 20s and minors recently. Um, oh, look, Keith Rickon's doing great work underage there and a few more of them, but I genuinely think they need a total clear out um, because a county that size that are underperforming so badly, it's just, like, it's no it's no good to anyone. Like. Not only from a Kerry point of view, let's say from a Dublin, Dublin winning all Ireland's, we, we all need a competitive car. They're a huge county. They have very good footballers there, but there's something not right. And obviously, when you're on the outside looking in, you'll never know the full extent of it. But um, no, look, they're, 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 that, sure, that game's no good to nobody. Sure, what yeah. good is that to the Cork lads? Um, no good to the Kerry lads either. Um, and it's no good to the people watching on TV. Um, so yeah i think they they need to wipe the slate clean over the winter start from scratch there's there's a good few lads in the panel that have been there knocking around for a while and they're in they're out they're in they're out and do you know what their their mindset against kerry can't be good Mm. so i think you need to clear out that mindset bring in the younger generation now and just start from scratch it'll take a couple of years um i see a lot of other counties limerick are a prime example who are starting to do that and you're starting to see results it's not going to happen next year or the year after this could be a four or five year project maybe more but the way they're going it just it's not going to get any better any anytime soon yeah so you see that as more than a bad day at the office that this is a systematic thing in cork that they're just not bringing through the players that they might have been 15 years ago or certainly 30 years ago yeah yeah like that i could even see yesterday and it's easy to sort of told them when you're getting hammered but the first 15 20 minutes they were all aggression all intensity and as soon as kerry started getting back and wheeling back in that aggression that intensity just disappeared mm. they started like lions they finished like pussycats that's that's along the short no matter kerry were in third gear like mm. i i came back to the bar after and um people were asking me how was the game with well, kerry very impressive and i said they were okay they were they were good but they weren't overly impressive it was Cork were that bad. Mm. Um, as soon as the heat came on and Kerry started moving the ball a bit quicker and uh, making the right decisions, that bit of fight and that bit of aggression that Cork started with, maybe it was the heat, I don't know, um, but it just died out. And uh, it was like, do you know what? You, you don't want to see that kind of thing happen to any team. We see that we saw it recently with Mayo and Leitrim, and we talked about it's no good for any team. It definitely shouldn't be happening with Kerry and Cork yeah um, so they need they need to start it because like that like i said they're i've been told they're a hurling county but not winning in hurling either yeah well they definitely need like cork is has enough football clubs and enough football tradition to not describe itself as one count one or another and we certainly That's can't lose them from the top table of football it's not there isn't enough big counties out there to have a chance of competing is there no that's the thing like and that's why i'm saying like obviously from Kerry point of view we need them but Football needs a, a strong competitive cork. Like if you look at all the teams, we're not going back that far. Like ten years ago, they won all Ireland. Yeah, possibly with that team, maybe they should have won a few more. Um, I think that'd be the argument with the, that group of players. They probably feel that they could have won a couple more. Um, but, but they were there. Then, thereabouts. They were there and their boats. They were in the conversation. They were in the equation. They're not in anyone's equation at the moment. And do you know what? As a former player, as a Kerry fan, you don't actually get any enjoyment in saying that. Um, because I know a few of the Cork lads now to get to know them over time, and you know they'd never give you an easy ride. They'd never, they'd never stop hitting and pulling and dragging at you, no matter how the game was going. And yeah, they just—I think they need to just restart. There's, there's no explaining it. I don't think um, they just need to start from scratch. 
Okay. Well, let's go back to Kerry then for a second because there, you know when we're talking in championship and maybe a team, our ma might be for an example, say of like, you know, that they're living with a team, they're playing very well, but ultimately playing Division Two or Division Three football costs them in the long run. They're not used to that standard. They're not used to it. If I was a Kerry fan, I'd be slightly worried about the fact that you're coming up against a Throne or Monaghan who are going to come through an absolutely ferocious Ulster Championship, really high quality, and not the old style ferocious where they all just beat the shit out of each other. This is like high quality games of like really good football. And they're going to come in without a week off as well, you know, and come in and play Kerry in Crow Park where Kerry have cast aside three teams really. You know, now that not often Kerry have three games, and if anybody's used to it, it will be Kerry as well. You know, like getting to this age, but you know, we've had the super eights, we've had at least quarterfinals in recent years. This is old school, and would you be worried that Kerry won't be kind of up to the pace of it, no matter how good they are? You would have to be worried. Um, personally, I think this Kerry team is good enough to beat both Monaghan and Tyrone, but like you said, they will be battle hardened from the the Ulster Championship and the Ulster Championship this year has been outstanding. Yeah. Um, all teams are free scoring as well, but they're very tenacious in the back. They're very aggressive and their aggression and intensity will last for more than 15 minutes. And then it's a case of how do Kerry regroup when this intensity doesn't die off after 15 minutes. So you would have to be worried because they've had no test. Um, I have a lot of confidence in this Kerry group. I think they're growing up nicely they're maturing really nicely as a team they seem to be very um united i think there's a good mentality amongst the players inside there um but you would be a bit wary um like monaghan are coming in a decent form um tyrone have been very good attacking wise this year i still think they're very open at the back where i think kerry will get joy but tyrone are especially tyrone are one team that if you wanted to get intense and aggressive for 70 minutes they will make it they will make it a war for you they will make every ball a nightmare to win and Kerry haven't had that yet so that's going to be the test that they're mentally going to have to get ready for physically Kerry look very good they look very fit they look very strong they look powerful mentally will they be able to cope with that intensity and aggression for a sustained period of more than 15 20 minutes off a team that are a couple of levels below them because at the moment that's what Cork are so now they're going to be coming up against team with the same level of fitness and intensity, but a lot more aggression. Yeah. Now they found like they, they'll have used the, it was a weird league. So it was almost like Kerry had to use the Munster Championship to kind of solidify their team. But they have mm -hmm. found one or two. Like it was a really, really good performance from from Breen yesterday, as well as you know, we talked about Paddy Clifford. That's adding on to what's already a very, very good team. Have you any worries about any any particular places? Like fullback is definitely still a, a concern, isn't it? You have to say after oh, the first 20 minutes yesterday. 100%. Um, look, I think the same issues were glaringly obvious. Um, teams are running through us that bit too easily. Um, for Brian Hurley's goal, look, Jason Foley's been outstanding this year. But for the first 20 minutes, he could have been whipped off. He just couldn't come to grips with Brian. Um, he left Brian go past him. He went straight in a goal, fairly easy. Got a couple of handy scores. Um, so the same issues are there with Kerry. Um, I don't see there being any changes to the back line, if I'm being honest. Um, <clears throat> I think Brian Begley has come on leaps and bounds mm -hmm. again this show. When he joined the panel first, um, he was a nightmare in training. Uh, he was constantly bombing up, getting goals of that. And I suppose over the last couple of years, he kind of stagnated a bit. Um, Maybe a couple of injuries, lost confidence. But this year, he's got a sustained run in the team. He looks comfortable. Do you know, sometimes having confidence that that's my jersey, I'm going to be on, is all a player needs. And he's driving on. So I think he's been, he's been very good. And like that, he was excellent, I thought, the weekend, especially when things weren't going great the first 20 minutes. He ended up going up Ryan Hurley and quietening him after that as well. So, look, I think the same issues are there for Kerry, that teams can run through the middle like that. I think it was Rory Dean had a fairly... Good chance to score a goal in the second half and scuffed it wide so the chances are there um carrier conceding chances so they, they'll still be worried about, about that but the forwards then are the ones um the forwards are doing the damage and like that david had one of his quieter days yesterday but it was a brother who picked up the sack shawnee probably started a bit slower than he has done but finished very strong paul gainey was close to the goal 
may not have been in the game all that much, but mm. he doesn't need to be. He's a finisher. Um, so look, there was a lot of positives, but it's the same, same issues. We didn't learn a whole pile about Kerry, to be honest, after that game. Yeah, which is a pity, as we've already talked about with Cork. What about Mayo? Did we learn much from them? It's it's like their second half performance. Like you expected Mayo after all these years, this is what they do. They'll come back into this game, but they were playing so poorly, abject really the first half, and then they just blitz Galway in a kind of a you know, in a way I don't think we were expected to see Galway um, offensively and all, especially kind of collapse in the way that they did, and they just could not get control of the ball. They couldn't score, and Mayo kind of without doing anything amazing had the game kind of won. You know, I know it took uh, Ruan's goal to kind of wrap it up fully in the end. There was only two points at that stage, but you never felt, oh, we were getting back into that game once Mayo took the lead. Do you know what? I think when the second half started, I think it became a, a game of a bit of grit and a bit of heart and a bit of effort, just a bit of fight. And to be honest, if if it if it comes down to that, I'm picking Mayo any day of the week over Galway. Um, Galway, very good footballers, nice team. It's either for a half or one game, and they're just Jekyll and Hyde. And all of a sudden, that game became a bit of a fight, and you could just see that Mayo had the bit between their teeth, and Galway disappeared. Mm. And to be honest, it, it wasn't that surprising. Once Mayo kind of upped the pace again, Galway disappeared. Simple yeah. as. They just don't seem to be able to get the bit between their teeth and go at it like that. Shane Walsh and Damian Palmer, two of the better players, two of the they're known as two of the top players in the county in the country sorry um big reputations and i don't like picking anyone out they're very good in the first half didn't see him in the second half mm. uh, and that's too that happens too often with them yeah is there there someone there to take the slack when it's not happening didn't have for david clifford party took the mantle you know um so they don't seem to have that and like that mayo mayo have evolved brilliantly under the radar they're missing one yeah. of their best players Killian O'Connor I know Damon O'Connor was back yesterday but uh O'Donoghue and Conroy are doing the business inside the second half they used Aidan O'Shea properly as a target man um and one thing that was evident again Mayo are the best tacklers in the game and Aidan O'Shea is the best tackler in the country I think they used him really well in the second half they look like they have an awful lot of energy they have a bit of zip about them mm. and they're all willing and able, and a bit like a few of the younger Kerry lads, they've they've got their chance in the Mayo jersey, and they're growing in confidence slowly, and they've come under the radar, which is unusual for Mayo. Um, <laughs> so normally there's more hype. So like they're, they're, they're going to be buzzing with the way they're going, and look, they will have learned an awful lot of lessons over the, over the last few years. But their game hasn't changed much. It's just a changing of uh, personnel, and there's probably younger, zippier legs in there and sometimes that bit of enthusiasm can drive you on. So, look, I suppose everyone's going to fancy Dublin to win and kick into gear um, this week coming. But I think if you're from Mayo, you'd rather be playing Dublin in a semi-final than final. So, look, I'm not going to throw any predictions because we don't know what's going to happen in the Leinster final. But I think Mayo will be very happy with how they're progressing. Um, the second half, a bit like Kerry, um, they'll be very happy with the maturity of the team um to be able to put the first half side and, and kick on but at the same time against a better team Galway should have been further ahead at half time and if yeah. they were further ahead there was game over ball burst so look, i think that's the thing mayo will come out of it delighted with the second half but knowing we have an awful lot to work on yeah yeah um the mayo evolution you're talking about and the fact that it has been a quiet evolution slash revolution mm -hmm. like i'm just looking through their starting 15 years say maybe and and maybe kevin mclaughlin coming on at half time as well you have henley keegan dermot o'connor aiden o'shea paddy durkin and mclaughlin as the only guys who are kind of there since the you know the 16 17 like that's not that long though you know that team that probably should have won one of those all Ireland finals at least that's really only four years ago there's a huge amount of new blood in this team. And it's I think it's a credit to Horan that, as you said, they kind of still play the same way. You still think mm -hmm. they're Mayo. And yeah. they're a very different team. Like They are. like, And it's amazing. Like, you, like They had some seriously loyal, brilliant servants. But there's a lot of heartache in them years as well. Like, And that can yeah. drain you a small bit. And it, it is heavy metal football they play. And four, five, six years of playing that 
I used to call it kamikaze football because they'd run at you from everywhere and it seemed to be no shape nor make to it at times, but it suited them. But after a while, you lose that bit of zip or your energy goes or, you know, something that you're doing 100%, you drop down to 95%. So sometimes just a couple of switches of positions, it just reinvigorates the team. And that seems to what happens. They have an awful lot of movement up in the forwards at the moment. I don't know who they are and Conroy, as we're saying, and... Um, they're just moving around the place and my big thing is if they can find a set position for Aiden and a way of playing that mm-hmm. suit him out second half they were way more direct if they can find a way like that for Aiden they'll go a long way because like I genuinely don't think there's anyone that can if Aiden gets the right ball in the right areas that will mark him um yeah and he's an intelligent footballer it's not about Aiden going out kicking one five one six he might even kick the ball but what he does when the ball when the opposition have the ball and when he can just get ball and pick out passes he'll do damage yeah yeah and he was out to feel way more in the first half and probably left a little yeah. bit stranded i suppose but as soon as yeah. right before half time he caught the ball inside <laughs> and you're sort of thinking that's the ball isn't it like he just he, well, he that's it and he that. had no he had no support that time yeah so yeah a lot of that is you just it's it's repeat 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 repetition that the boys that are there going Right, that's going into Aiden. He's going to win it. Right, if I'm going to score, I need to get off him. And when you know a pass is going to be made, you'll automatically run. Like, do you know, you, you start building up these relationships that, right, certain area of the field, that's going into Aiden. Right, I know where he's going to win it. I'm going to go. And that will come in time, but they need to stick with that way of playing. And sometimes that means you need to stick Aiden into a certain area of the field where you're not bringing him in and out too often. Like yesterday mm-hmm. in the first half, it was not a day for Aiden to be out around the middle. It was too hot. It was going to be like most championship games at the start. They, they start very all over shop. It's fast paced. It's frenetic. In that heat, it was never going to suit Aiden. Yeah. What do you do if you're Galway then before we leave this match? Because, like, you look at them on paper constantly. You think, like, some of these young lads coming through, like like the Kellys, like, you know, Tierney's. Um, you've got Damien Comer, you've got Shane Walsh, you've got Paul Conroy, all really, really good footballers, you know, Kieran Malloy, all these guys. On paper, it's such a good team. Then sometimes they play like such a good team and you know the potential that's there. And, you know, maybe like they have someone like Ian Burke coming back next year, hopefully, you know, or, or, or something like that. What can change to stop that being a them being maybe when they when the chips were down against Monaghan in the relegation final, they were a 65-minute team who didn't hold on for that five minutes after dominating the game. And then yesterday, 35-minute team, you know, brilliant for a while. Chips are down. Mayo come back at them. They wilt. They're a young team, but something has to change there, doesn't it, for them to kind of get over that? Yeah, I think you probably hit the nail on the head. Unknowingly there, you're like, nice players, nice team. You need a couple of not nice fellas inside <laughs> there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, we'd all love to be a nice team playing nice free flowing football, but the opposition are never going to leave you do that. And yeah. you may have periods in the game where you can play a lovely football. But sometimes you need a couple of fellas who maybe not the best footballers, they're more workers or they're a bit more physical, a bit more rough and ready. But you need to find that. I think Mayo need to find that balance. We've said it, we've named old players lovely footballers. Lovely footballers don't win championships. You need you need a mixture, and I don't think they have that mixture at the moment. It's probably a case of the best footballers in the best positions are playing, and that just doesn't work. And it was the same. It's very similar with Kerry, and I said that you you've great footballers in the back at times, but sometimes the best players just don't click, yeah, um, and they don't work together. And that's where sometimes you sacrifice a certain side of your game just to steady the ship and they might have to go down that road where look you have outstanding footballers there and they might need a few more workers more physical maybe even some nastier footballers with them that will do a lot more to rough and tumble for them absolutely yeah well we'll see what happens with them and whether it's under poor choice or how they get on um next year but uh mayo and kerry into the all-ireland semi-finals is probably where we expect it to be at this point who'll be joining them uh Tyrone or Monaghan and then also Dave too he wants to know if uh, Darren thinks the plucky underdogs Dublin have any chance now I don't know whether he means against Kildare uh, next week or <laughs> or in the same yeah. no I still think Dublin are the Dublin are still top tier I genuinely think Kerry are just below them and then you have your Mayo's Tyrone's whatever but like that 
I wouldn't call them plucky underdogs anyway. I'd call them a lot of teams that are not plucky <laughs> underdogs. But no, Dublin are still the, the top dog. As simple as that. I know the, the odds have changed or whatever, but Kerry have played nothing and Dublin played two games where they were, look, they were going through the motions. Um, if they'd won them by 10, 15, 20 points, to what, what difference would it make? So like that, they're going to start um, kicking into gear. You'd imagine this weekend, if they don't, look, it's all up in the air. Um, but sometimes they need, like that, every team, they need to be up against a male who they know will bring the fight to them. Mm. But who's, who knows? Maybe he'll there pull off a shot. Can't see it myself, but you never know. Okay, well, we'll see what happens. I, I can't see it myself either, to be honest. Sorry to everybody who's watching in Kildare. Hopefully, you proved us <laughs> all wrong just for, for the for the game. I'm not trying to be biased here or anything like that. But, Darren, uh, thanks a bit. Before we go, actually, we've been running yeah. our uh, rolling all stars on uh, Balls E all year um, with PwC. And um, we have last week's team here, I think, to show you now. Uh, this is um, this is last week's football team, or who, who we ended up with. Uh, we're mm -hmm. going to be picking this later on in the week, and we'll be putting it out on our social channels. But if you were to if you were to have one veto or someone to keep in or to put in from what we have here, so we'll be able to see the the team now. That's how we, how we ended up um, last week. Uh, so we've got Rena Neal in midfield, Matthew Tierney, uh, the, and you can see it there, a couple of dubs. Mm. Only two Kerry lads in, but Sean O'Shea and Paddy Clifford, arguably the two top performers of the weekend as well. Uh, so they'll yeah. be staying in anyway. Yeah, I think if I was to put in any two, I think it would probably be Ruan from Mayo. Yeah. And it would be a toss-up between either the two boys, um, Mullins and uh, O'Hora. The two warriors in the back with the long hair. Um, <laughs> they be the kind of two cent. I, I find it hard for the carry. Like Brian Bagley was outstanding. I'd try and squeeze him in, but um, other than that, I think it's. Uh, I think with the two Mayo lads, I think Ruan is real box to box midfielder. Yeah. Having said that, I think Dave Moore was outstanding for Kerry uh, the weekend. Yeah, um, he's just he was commanding around the middle, kept it very simple, and just did his job quietly effective. Um, but I think for the impact Ruan probably made box to box, um, you'd be I'd be putting him in there after the weekend and like that. The two boys in the heart of the Mayo defence were outstanding as well the weekend. Okay, well the selection panel has your advice there anyway, so uh, stay tuned uh, later on in the week to see if they take your uh, t t take it on board. Um, there's been all kinds of fights and walk offs and everything like that. We might actually need to recruit a few people for the selection committee. There's been so many resignations over the last while. But Darren, thanks so much. We'll chat to you next week um, after the, the, the provincial finals and looking ahead to the semis. Perfect. Cheers, mate. Talk to you later. Thanks a million to Darren. Now, don't forget, if you're enjoying the show, to please do subscribe, be it on YouTube if you're watching there, or if you're listening on the podcast, please subscribe and leave us a rating. Right, still to come, we've got uh, Guest the Handicaps with PJ and Gary, uh, Gary defending champion there. Going to look ahead to the four games at the weekend, and we will be looking at the best GEA-sponsored jersey combinations over the years with um, our man Finch. But before we get to that... Uh, again, only six teams left in the hurling championship now as well. Um, after the qualifiers uh, rounded up at the weekend, wins for Cork and for Waterford. Former Tipperary All Ireland winner and captain Shane McGrath is with us as always. Shane, how are you? Well, Mike, how's things, Mike? They're good, uh, Shane. Despite Claire's uh, Claire's exit from the championship, you were there in Limerick on um, on Saturday. Uh, I don't think we probably would have deserved it if they got it, but I have to say when Tony Kelly got the ball in his hand and broke through and I saw it on the hurley and I saw daylight in front of him, after the performance he had, I didn't see anything else but the uh, the, the ball nestling into the bottom corner. I was so shocked when, in fairness, a pretty great save happened and, and Cork uh, probably got a deserved victory in the end. Yeah, and I suppose being at the game... Mike, you know, and like you know yourself as a Clare fan and as a Hurland fan, like myself, uh, Harry Clodge were on duty and we we just felt the ball has fell to the right person. And I think even all the Cork people felt the ball has had fallen to the right person. But or the wrong person for them, yeah. It was the wrong person for them, but like, you know, you know, it was third week out in a row for Clare and, you know, third week in, in, in heat, like even the day they played tip in the month semi-final, that, that, that was a hot day as well, you know, what not, mm. not compared to the last two weeks, but still a hot day and, you know, the last out against Wexford, GD, I was at that match as well. It was, it was, you know, as Darren was saying there, it was hard even just walking in from your car into into just take your seat in the stadium, let alone yeah. try and play the match. But, you know, 
he, Tony Kelly, look, he did he did everything right. He he broke free. He found a bit of space that maybe a lot of other players in the pitch mightn't have found. And the ball off the hurley, you know, if some butts, I suppose if he could take it in his hand again, it would have been a different strike, but it was off the hurley. But you know, listening to Cork people there during the week or even since, you know, listen to John Myler and his comments, and he all has said that Patrick Collins, you know, he mightn't have the same puck outs or the same Maybe distribution is what Anthony Nash has, but I feel he he's getting there and he's very close to it. But that mm. they always said that his shot stopping ability is unbelievable, and uh, I think he proved that. Very very brave, stood tall, and um, blocked the shot. Cork won them a lead in afterwards. You know the bit yeah. of when the ball broke, and uh, I think you know I, I think it's a great sign of this Cork team the way the way that they ground out this result because I suppose I've been maybe a critic of Cork. You know that if if it was a fail in the Gale skills competition, Cork would probably win it most years, but. You know, hurling, winning hurling championship isn't, and you need you need hard work at first and foremost to, to get over the line. And they worked really, really hard the other day. And um, you know, when Claire came back at them, I thought their response was was absolutely massive. I think as soon as Claire went ahead, Mike, that Cork actually after Jim Ryan got that point, Cork actually outscored Claire then one five to a point in the in the in the next eight or nine minutes. And I think that's that's a great sign of a of a team who want to progress in in championship hurling, like. Yeah, it's a really, really interesting point and a really good one as well. And I think of um, Gary Cooney, he got a, a, a goal with his first touch last week and almost did it again. You think Robert Downey made this brilliant tackle. And Cork really did ground it out when they actually, you know, when they needed to. And it isn't. And I think that's epitomized by, you know, Seamus Harndy winning man of the match. And like, really bad shooting day for him as well, like missed a load of scores. But the fact that he was just everywhere, when Cork are at their best in that particular way, as you're talking about, it's always with him, isn't it? When you think back to the last team yeah. that, you know, they could have won All-Ireland when they lost that semi-final to, to Limerick. You know, Harnady was at the core of it as well. And he kind of always epitomises Cork when they're at their fighting best. Like Absolutely, yeah. And like it was two of the stalwarts, I suppose, that, that they did stand up from the other day. Um, like, I think there was only two Cork players involved in the 2013 final, Mike uh, Harnady and Hoggy, uh, Patrick Horgan. And the two of them, you know, were very good the other day. Now, I, I, I'll I, be totally honest, right? I, I was at the match and I looked down and seen Seamus Harnady get man of the match. And I thought he worked very, very hard. It was a bit of a head scratcher for me. Uh, maybe the, the lads who were doing the telly felt that he that he worked hard. He was involved in two of the goals. And I, I was keeping a tick of it as his, his match was going on and about his efforts, like, you know. And as I said, worked ferociously hard, great vision to pick out Barrett as well. And uh, what an impact Sob himself and Alan Connolly were scoring one, two mm. off the bench. But James Hardy could have easily had seven points from play the other night. Now, uh, I don't know if there are many people that got seven points from play at the weekend. I know Niall O'Brien from Westmeath got seven points from play, and it's it's some it's some going like, but he'll he'll look back and he'll say like that if he was a bit bit more calm on the ball, you know, maybe not as rushed with his shots. There was a swirling breeze in the Gaelic grounds there as well. So Seamus Harnady, he would uh, he had he had seven shots at goal, scored two points. I think he had four wides, and and uh, he was kind of hooked as w- one of his shots, and, and he ended up dropping short into David Quilligan's hand. So, like, while while Cork, I suppose a lot of the time, Mike, we always kind of say about Cork that their problem is in defence, maybe right? That they would score an awful lot, but mm-hmm. that they would concede an awful lot. Now, for me, it's actually the other way around at the moment, in, in my opinion. Um, I think that their outstanding players the other night were their backs. I thought Robert Downey was absolutely brilliant. Sean O'Donoghue was on his third man finishing the game. Like mm. he had he had seen off Ian Galvin, all right. Mark Rogers came on. Um, I think he came on, was it after 28 minutes? Got taken off after 51 minutes. That'll tell you the yeah. job Sean O'Donoghue did on him. And finishing up the game then, Gary Cooney is the third man he's marking. I thought Nile O'Leary, I thought he did a relatively good job in Tony Kelly. Now Tony scored four points from play. But like I mean, it's like as I said before, it's like it's like going swimming with, with, without getting wet, um, trying to curb Tony Kelly's in, influence in a game. Like you know, it's just it's it's impossible to do with the form he's in. So four points to play for him. Um, Tim O'Mahony, fine game, and John Miller, absolutely brilliant as well. You know, and Darth Gibbon and Luke Meach in with three points from play. So what what I'm saying is like I thought at the back they were very very solid, and at up front in that out of the six starting forwards that that four of them got taken off. Now, I think Seamus Hardy got taken off his 70, 71 minutes. He was just tired, but mm. Alan Cadigan just didn't happen for him. Shane Kingston scored 1 1, but you know, you know, I've seen, we've all known the potential he has. Robbie O'Flynn, one point from play. Like, I've seen this guy be knocking over four or five points from play for at his ease. Like, so, you know, Hoggy, I thought Hoggy was very good. You know, he chipped in with three points from play and he also scored seven frees. And Jack O'Connor got his goal. 
Um, you know, got two up, yellows. Yeah. There was I just remind us fair funny you now at the match, like there was confusion. I, I say the other night, it was like we were all given an applied maths paper for the leaving sort. None of us had a clue what was going on with the with the with the red cards. You know, there was Les just leaving the field. Next thing a red a red would pop up on the screen there that someone got sent off, and we were all trying to figure it out. So obviously we figured out afterwards Jack Connor got two yellows and obviously Niall O'Leary got, got got two yellows then here at the at the very end of the game as well. But like Cork, you know, we seen him in the league, Mike, didn't we? Like eighteen goals in the league, I think. Yeah. And, uh, three goals the other night. It's six goal chances the other night. Jack O'Connor, like you know, even watch him after he got the goal, he wanted another goal straight away. Brilliant save by Ever Quilligan. But the Cork boys want goals, but I just think as a forward, as their units, like I think that if four of their forwards are getting taken off the next day for for underperformance, it, it won't mm. uh, it, it it won't it won't see him over over the line, in my opinion. Like. Yeah, so how much of that is Claire playing maybe an extra man back as well and being pretty good in defence and maybe leaving those, like trying to stop that shooting to and maybe not doing enough to cover the goal chances if Cork are getting six of them? Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. I thought Colin Malone was absolutely brilliant for Claire at that job. He kind of dropped deep for a lot of the time. And on the other side, then Luke Mead was dropping deep a lot of the time for Cork. And I suppose Colin Malone shipped in with three points. So yeah, I suppose, I suppose it, it, it is a factor. But for me, that they are probably going to come up against the team, especially Dublin the next day, who who do tend to drop back Conor Burke. So they're going to have to try and figure out a way of how they're going to get around this. Because as mm. I said, you know, four years starting forwards, get taken off it, it just won't be enough to get through to the next round of the championship and Dublin do they do they are very good at that defensive game and working it out through the lines and, and getting the ball into into their shooters you know into the Ronan Hayes into the shoot Hayes you know into the Donald Burks of this of this world like so they're going to have to come up with a, a plan to say look lads we need to figure out a way of how do we get the get past this extra defender or our sweeper like you know this yeah. sweeper world is the sweeper world is nearly banned now but sure that's that's what it is like you know that's what it is in soccer sweeper over and back like so that's that's what it is in hurling too so they are <laughs> going to have to come up with a way and like you know they were they were also playing a team third um you know third week on the road as i said in testing conditions so like for me the clear lads while they gave it everything you know you could see them i use rory hayes as an example i think rory hayes in a foot race with anyone in ireland in uh, inter-county would would be there thereabouts i'd love to see him take on kyle hayes over 100 meters see how they get on you know but i just feel Jack O'Connor rounded him. If it was two weeks earlier, Mike, and if Rory Hayes was a little bit fresher and things like that, he might not have gone around him quite as easy for his goal. So I think that's they're 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 all small, they're all small things, but you know, they're all the one percenters now are going to be the thing that get teams mm. over the line like from now on. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see like if Dublin are at close to full strength next week and what kind of a game. I think everyone remembers the 2013 semi-final. Not many left over from those games, but there is, uh, as you mentioned, two from Clare, maybe three or four from Dublin. But um, I'm looking forward to that. But the in terms of Clare then, before we move on to the other match, which is as worthy of discussion, if not more, um, it was a weird year. Like, I mean, there was four weird league, first of all, that they, you know, they lost to Antrim, ended up beating Kilkenny. But then... Uh, they had this. It was a bit of an odyssey in the championship for such a quick championship to have those four games: uh, win two, lose two, uh, great moments, and like I don't know. I just wonder where you think they are. If you think like I know every team has injuries. It felt like Shane O'Donnell is so important to how Clare play in in the forwards, especially, and he wasn't seen all year really with the concussion. But they've brought through a couple. It feels that there might be a couple of hurlers short of the top top level, though. I'd be interested to know what you think. And then obviously there's the the Tony Kelly aspect of it, where he just continues to amaze at the moment. And there's the I don't know if the neutral is in a situation where they just feel sorry for this guy that he isn't. He just happens to not be with a team who are progressing into mm -hmm. All Ireland semi finals and finals every year as his career goes by. Yeah, I think first and foremost, the most important thing in Clare at the moment, Mike, is. This this group of Clare hurlers and this Clare management have all the backing of the Clare public yeah. and, and all the Clare hurling people. And I think that's a massive, massive win for them. Um, with everything else that's going on, with all the issues that's been well documented about the county board and how there needs to be change in the county board, about how the underage, they're just not, they're not able to compete, getting bet by 40 points in minor hurling. Like it's demoralizing for any 16, 17 year old lad who has aspirations to play for his county and wants to play for his county if he feels that the setup isn't there. And if there's a better setup, maybe in in a in a soccer club or a rugby club, you know they're they're all worrying things for Clare. So I think that this group of hurlers and this management have kind of brought hope and a kind of a, you know have shed light on things in in Clare, and that they have a group that they can believe in, they have a manager that they can believe in, and that was very evident there now Saturday night, Mike. Anyone that was there, every Clare hurling fan that was there, they they stayed on, they waited till the Clare lads met the Cork lads, had their quick chat in the field, and every one of them standing up 
give him a huge round of applause to the Clare Hurling team because mm. I suppose they know what they've, they've given him this year. You know, as you said, four matches for the last three weeks, the Clare public, they've been on a highlight looking forward to trying to get to the games and everything. And I, I think I think there's a good bunch there. I think they're relatively young. If I, if I look down through them, you know, you know, the elder statesmen are the likes of maybe John, John Conlon, Colum Galvin, Tony Kelly, you know, they're kind of the elder statesmen, but it's still nowhere near finishing inter-county hurling, like, you know. And then you have the new the new blood that's come in, you know, the Rory Hayes, the Dermot Ryans, you know, Dermot was there last year as well. You know, David Reed, he's back in joining his hurling. Ryan Taylor has been brilliant. Mark Rogers will have better days. He'll learn an awful lot from Mark and Sean O'Donoghue. So I think there's a good nucleus there. There's a good mix of experience, of youth. And I think there can be no doubt that Brian Lowen has to be the manager there next year, you know, if, if, if he wants to be. Mm. And I, I just feel the confidence they get from this and, you know, get get them all back again. I, I, I do think Clare are going in the right way. And, you know, if they if they get all the stuff off the field sorted as well and, and financially get, get behind the team, you know, and all the clubs get behind all the uh, the team as well and, you know, get to where they want to go. I think I think Clare are, 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 on, an, are on an upward curve. And uh, yeah. I, I, I do feel that they are, they've, they've put themselves back into the fray of a team that, you know, can, can really, really challenge for, for, for things in, uh, in, in for, uh, for, for years to come there as well, Mike. Okay, well, we'll see more of Cork. We won't see any more of Clare. We'll see what happens. And uh, well, I think everybody hopes that Lowen, I think around the country, everybody hopes that Lowen stays on. So let's hope, um, let's see what happens there. But the other match, was, uh, the other match is just so hard to figure out in a way. Like, you know, I mean, yeah. what, what, I don't want to start with Galway because I really do want to give Waterford their credit. And I feel like that they've been, they, they haven't hardly been talked about this year. But you almost have to start with Galway, <laughs> Shane, yeah. because like, what? What's going on with this team? Like, I haven't heard any rumors or anything like that. But you immediately start to think, "Jesus, there's something. Is there something in the camp? Is there a split? Is there? Uh, are they not behind their manager? I don't know any of these things. It's pure speculation. But what I'm saying is, you start to speculate and you start to think these things because that's not these two performances for 65 minutes or 68 minutes or whatever it was yesterday in the whole game against Dublin are not the Galway team that we know are there and that the the talent level that they have. No, absolutely not. And you know, um, if, we, if, we, if we, like as you said, we start with Galway. Like, I mean, um, the reason Ana Murphy wasn't playing, we, we were led to believe, is for 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 COVID reasons. You know, but I suppose they were they were lucky in a way in that they didn't lose as many players as Dublin did. Like, you take when mm-hmm. when Dublin were hit with it, they were lost four players, four players who would have made an impact. Two of them starters, two guys would have came on as well. And like to be fair, like to be fair to the goalkeeper, like you know, he, he, I thought he did fine. You know, he, I thought he did a very, very good job. I thought he was very, very solid. In um, Derek Fahey is from that our Dragon Club. You know, he stepped in and he did fine. Do you know, it's interesting, Mike. Like people say that if you go in at half time and you might be down or something like this, you know, and if you come out and you blitz the second half and you win the game, well, then at half time, there's one of two things. If you come out and win the game as an inspirational speech, yeah. if you come out and lose the game, it was a row. <laughs> and that seems to be that seems to be the way, you know, that 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 could have been the way the week before below in Cork, like, you know, when, when Limerick lads went in, yeah. you know, and they were down 10 points. And now it's an inspirational stuff. But if they'd lost the match, it would have been a row. So, like, I I personally haven't heard of any unrest in the no, camp. Neither you know, fairness, speculation yeah. whether they, you know, they're maybe they're very good at keeping things in house or whatever, and they have a lot of respect for the group like that. But I haven't heard it, Mike. And I just don't know what what it was. Like you think about going into the third. Going into the second water break, end of the third quarter, and Watford are winning the match 125 to 12 points. Like, if it was olden days, and I talk about olden days like two years ago when there was a massive crowd at the match, if you were a Watford fan, 125 to 12 points, or you were a Galway fan, and there's 40 or 45, 50,000 people at the match, you're chancing getting out early to beat the track. <laughs> you know, you are like, but you know, obviously, they made a, they made a brilliant comeback. I think, I think uh, that uh, their comeback was as much a factor of Watford being down to 14 men. Yeah. And as I said, second uh, second week playing in very, very hot conditions, there was going to be a purple patch for Galway. There had to be with the extra man and with the heat and with Galway after having a very tough game against Leash the week before and Galway coming in and uh, Watford having a tough game against Leash, Galway coming in a more rested team. I just I just can't put my finger on it. Like, I mean, uh, like you think about it, Jason Flynn came in and scored 2-1. He was the top scorer from play for him. Do you know, and like we're talking about Watford, Galway forwards, Connor Whelan, Joe Canning, Brian Cannon, Carl Mannion went up there eventually. Like the Coonies, like what? Like like Evan Nyland, you know, not being able to make the team. Like I, I, I honestly would have him on the team. I think, you know, he's free taking ability. Now not wrong with Joe Canning's free taking ability, and obviously what an achievement by him to top scorer in the championship as well. But like Evan Nyland, I thought he was brilliant in the league. And look, 
I don't know. It's a real head scratcher for me. I think it's a real head scratcher for the Galway management as well, Mike, to be honest. Like Shane O'Neill, you know, what he did with the Pierce, he's a very, very well respected guy. Like second year now, you know, they lose out in the semi final stage last year, you know, put up a very good display against Limerick. For me, Limerick weren't that full tilt in that game. I, I, I thought Limerick could have gone another gear if they really had to. And now, yeah. They don't, they don't even reach a quarter-final stage. So, obviously, Galway is a county with, when they look at the talent that they have, questions will be asked, like, to say, like, why couldn't you get a song out of these lads? But, look, mm. it's very, very difficult because, honestly, Mike, can my heart haven't heard anything of, of unrest or anything like that. And if there is, you know, they've, they've kept it in-house, which fair play to them as a group for, for doing that. But it's a head-scratcher for all of us looking in, isn't it, with the talent they have, like. It's going to be hard to come back from this, though, isn't it? If you look at, like, the age profile of the team, not tremendously old, but, like, if you think Joe, Connor Cooney, Joseph Cooney, Go McInerney, Dahi Burke, David Burke obviously wasn't really involved this year, but he's still there. And, you know, it, it, it is an older team, really, in terms of in terms of years on the field anyway, I, not necessarily by age. And it's, you know... it. They have to lift themselves for it again and believe that they can go and win all Ireland if they're going to be a team who can genuinely contend to win all Ireland. And that's going to be a hard thing to do this winter, like isn't it? After you know, again, when you're you you're you've got Joe thirty three next year or whatever if he comes back, and then they're they're kind of still going to rally around him and and believe that they can win all Ireland. Yeah, yeah, you know, like I mean, sometimes there's some losses and it does. Like it does take the winter to get over them, like, but I suppose they'll go back now and play a club championship in the next few weeks. They'll absolutely hop off each other as they do up in the Galway club. Yeah. And it's, it's always very, very physical. And there's, you know, whether you're best friends in the county panel or not, as soon as the club jersey goes on, we'll do whatever it takes to win with the club. And that's the way it should be 100%. It's, it is, it is a difficult one, you know, it is a difficult one. I don't think there'll be too many lads leaving, you know. I mean, you, you mentioned Joe. I feel Joe is in great shape as well. And mm. With everything that we have in sports science now, he'll know exactly what he needs to be or where he needs to be at. I I don't feel Joe will step away. David Burke, you know, maybe, you know, when he didn't see much game time this year, you know, he he could be one that may be stepping away. Um, hard to know, but, like, we don't want to be retiring anyone here either today, Mike. But as you said, the spine of their team, you know, they're, they are getting a little bit older, all right. But, I mean, there's a conveyor belt of talent there in Galway winning minors, five five in a row minors, wasn't it? Um, you know, um. Serious, serious talent coming up through there. They're, they're under 20s going well as well. So maybe like, you know, maybe people feel like there are going on in own, other counties, like my own county as well. And maybe people will feel that, look, we need to see some of these some of these younger guys given more of a chance in the league, you know, and things like this. And, you know, and start trusting them more and, and put them into the fray. Um, but look, I mean, what an array of talent they have. Like, I mean, you're, you're looking down through their team and you're, and you're wondering, like, how can this happen? Like, how can this just capitulation happen? Like, I mean, two... For Galway hurling terms, two terrible performances in the championship this year. Like, I mean, who could you say actually played really well in the matches for Galway? Yeah. Like, like Connor Connor Whelan was one guy I suppose for me that 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 did that did stand up and did and did try his best. One three against Dublin, I think three points the last day. But like for all the talent that they have, um, yeah, it's 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 a it, it is a head scratcher. It'll be interesting to see how many changes are are going to happen with with with, with personnel as well. I mean, what. What are the Galway County Board going to do? Are they going to put their faith in, in Shane O'Neill? Again, I I feel they should. I think I, I think he does have a lot to offer. Like, you know, I think he has proven that with, with the Pearshig, but suppose a lot of people will say then there's a big difference between winning a club and winning inter-county level. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's it is uh I can't uh, I I don't have the answer here today. I don't uh, don't have the magic beans for you on that one anyway, uh, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a great weekend for to be a, a Galway GEA fan uh, in general, I would say. Um, whereas at least at least Cork got the the win to hurl it, if not quite the football. Um, before we go, we haven't talked about Waterford, and like I again, I really don't want to be unfair to them because. I feel like even if Galway did show up, there's a good chance Waterford would have won that match with the way they played. You know, we'd be having a different conversation about Galway then, but Waterford mm. is the same boat. Like, but Shane Bennett's first point, you know, the first point of the match, yeah. where he just did that at 100 miles an hour, the dummy um, solo over the bar, and you're thinking to yourself, this is Waterford. You know what I mean? They're here today. Oh, yeah, yeah. In the first 20 minutes, you're like, this is the Waterford hurler that when they're at their best, they're absolutely as good as anybody in the country. And you're thinking... It's great. It, it, it's such a testament to Liam Cattle, in fairness, that after what happened against Clare, struggled against Leash, and they blitzed Galway in the first 20 minutes. Um, like that's a really good sign, a good good group, and a good management. I think, I think, I think it is absolutely Mike, and I think it's they sent out they sent out a message in their team selection for me. You know, going with Caelan Lies, Shane Bennett, Kieran Bennett. Um, you know, they lost the early daily as well through injury, like and and they've lost Heidi Burka. So Shane Bennett's probably their third choice, number six. 
But like as you said, Mike, and you're dead right. The way he took that first ball on and he took it on and he he, he was going forward and he was going for the score. Like their half back line scored five points from play, which was more than Galway scored in the first half from play. And that just sent out a message that they were going for this. There was no sitting back. We we're going to attack this game, and and rightly so. And they won every. They won, like, you know, the first quarter, 9-7. For me, Watford dominated that first quarter. Absolutely dominated it. Second quarter, then, was, was more a true reflection, I think, of the game and how Watford's dominance, and they won it 1-9 to two points. And, like, you know, between the 13th and the 25th minute, then, Watford scored seven points in a row. Seven points in a row between minute 13 and 25. Mm -hmm. Galway didn't even get a scoring. And that just showed, like, the complete dominance they had, the way they were, they were taking this game to Galway. There was no backward step. And Galway just didn't seem to have an answer for them. And and also a, a major factor in it is Jamie Barron is back. He's back yeah. in the team. Players look to him. His first full championship game uh, this year and scores four points from play. And he was absolutely immense. So he was in the middle of the field. And he's one of their, he's their leaders. You know, he's he's the heartbeat of this one for team for me. And when he's going well up and down the field, the rest of the lads just fill with confidence. And, you know, the Caleb Lyons is, uh, of the world, uh, like, you know, like, you know, his, his position is not back, corner back. And while he tried his best to man mark Tony Kelly, his position is out there, half back line, midfield, middle, middle third, turning ball over, going forward, chipping in with, with scores as well. And that's and that's where he excels as well. And I suppose one guy as well who, who didn't score, I don't think he's don't know if he scored from play, Desi Hutchinson. Yeah. And he, he and he was the epitome of, of Liam Cattle teams, Mike. As in you work hard for the team and you do it for the team. And then if you get your score well and good, but it's all about the team and the team wins, everyone wins. And Desi Hutchinson epitomized that in the first half. I think, um, not I'm not sure the time it was, but I think it was in the second quarter. The ball, the Galway defenders coming out with the ball. Desi Hutchinson has no right to do it. He runs 20 25 yards to get something on the ball. He gets a hook in. Watford win the break, comes to him. He flicks the ball back over his shoulder. And I think it's Kieran Bennett, I think, comes in and, and gets the gets the score. Now, Desi Hutchinson doesn't get to get the credit for the score, but I'm sure tonight or tomorrow night. He's getting massive, massive kudos inside that Watford dressing room from the management. And, you know, he has set the standard of work rate up in the forwards now the next day for whoever wants to take on the mental of it. But I think that's what they brought. They brought a ferocious intensity, a work rate, and an honesty of a team. And Liam Cahill's quote, I think, sums it up for me, is that today is brilliant, but it will count for nothing if we don't recover and back it up next week. And that word recover, Mike, is, is vital for, for the energy that Watford need to play the game that they play, that, they will, that recovery will be the most important thing they can do this week, getting ready for... The tip game, the battle of the Leams, Cahill versus Sheedy. I tell you, as soon as I heard the draw this morning, um, I think every tip person was like, here's Liam Cahill's chance now to take on Tipperary in Championship Hurling. It's, it's one he's been waiting for uh, since he got the Waterford job, I'm sure. I know, and can't wait for it in so many ways. And you'd wonder about Waterford's recovery. It's, it's funny you're saying about like you know who played well for Galway, and you're kind of thinking who didn't play well for Waterford in a way. Yeah. Like, you know, you're talking about Barron, but you know Jack Fagan, the goalkeeper, like you know, and, and you know a lot of questions as well after Stephen O'Keefe has moved on. I just thought that they were brilliant all over the field, and I have to say it was great to see because it Waterford in the past, Shane, have had these on-off yeah. years, you know, yeah. and. This looked like it was going to be an off year after winning the All Ireland final. Two games they didn't perform, and then they did. And it's I again not to kind of keep going on about Liam Cattle, but that just hasn't happened for Waterford in the last few years. They've either been one or the other, sublime or ridiculous almost, you know. And now they've showed that they could stay there and compete. So um, I I don't know. I'm fascinated by next week. What do you, <laughs> would you be worried as a tip man first of all? Oh God, you would. And I totally, I'll be totally honest. Like it's 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 the draw that like Tipperary fans, not the not the group. The group are, are are at a stage now where you know when you're involved in a group, you're like, look, if we're going to go on, we have to beat. We have to try and beat everyone anyway. But you know, Tipperary fans have been saying this Wat Watford is going to be a tricky one. This is going to be tricky because they're coming in now. You know, the 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 buzz is up. I think they had eight out of the fifteen from the All Ireland final last year, starting against Clare. I think I think they're up to ten now, maybe. Um, you know, but as I said, Jamie Barron being one of them is absolutely massive for them. Mm -hmm. Jack Fagan, brilliant. You know, um, very very solid in defence. Prunty's back as well. You know, like I mean, he's 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 massive for them as well down the spine of their team. Like you know, and the Bennett's like the Bennett brothers are they're just lighting it up there as well. The three of them, you know, I mean, imagine. Uh, Imagine their house trying to get the porridge ready, trying to get it just right. Uh, like the three bears, one hot, one cold, one just right for the Bennett brothers there for championship day. But, uh, you know, and like, as I said, Desi Hutchinson, we associate him with, with scoring all the time, but his work rate he brought the last day. This is a tricky one, right? But I'd say Watford haven't bet tip in championship hurling since uh, 2008. Uh, I think we've oh. played, I think we played, I think we played eight times since tip of one seven. So if, if, if it's like Watford and Galway going in the last day, if history's anything to go by, um, 
the only time Galway actually bet Waterford in a championship hurling was in the 2017 final. So they played 11 times and Waterford had won 10. Now they've played 12 and Waterford have won 11. So out of the last, since 2008, when I was involved that day, you know, in the semi final, Waterford bet us and deservedly so. You know, Tip have won seven times and there's been a draw. So I'm sure Tip will, uh, Tip lads will be hoping for a little bit of a repeat of history, but it, it is a very, very tricky one. There's so much going on. As I said, the battles of the leans on the sideline will be, will, will, will be one side show and what's going on in the pitch. And I suppose what, what team Tip are going to go with, Mike? Are they going to go with what, what started the last day or, are they, or is Lean going to say, look, I need to maybe finish with my strongest team here the next day against a high energy water team, get the most out of who, what I can for 45, 50 minutes. And then, you know, you know, maybe keep some of the, the more experienced guys in reserve to finish out this game. So look, there's so many permutations. It's, it's, it's going to be fascinating as well. And, you know, obviously with Dublin Cork on the other side, Dublin haven't beaten Cork in Championship Hurling. My stats are right. 1927. I heard you talking earlier on about the Munster football uh, <laughs> results. So 1927. They won that match by 14 points. So the Dublin lads will be happy enough if they can do that again. So another, another, another great weekend of sport coming up, Mike. You wouldn't have time to breathe between watching skateboarding in the Olympics and watching <laughs> hurling and uh, everything. It's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. So it's, it's brilliant. The Olympics finish up just in time for the GEA every week. So uh, our, uh, all weekend. So it's um, it's perfect for us all. Uh, look, it's going to be some weekend. Can't wait for it, and we'll 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 chat to you about how they go and looking into straight into the semis. Then, like it's an absolute just hectic calendar. But uh, before we go, uh, Leash will still be playing Division One uh, mm-hmm. hurling next year. They they beat Westmead by a goal, love high scoring game, one twenty seven twenty seven points. I think a lot of discussion about whether or not you know um, we should be relegating teams. I I don't always love that discussion. I think so, but maybe when it's you know, in the, in this scenario, when we are trying to kind of get the smaller teams, especially in the league, up and playing more games against the better counties and trying to um, trying to develop it, it is a worthy discussion. But more importantly, I think it's important to kind of give Leash a due and Cheddar Plunkett a due their due this year because during the league, I was there thinking, Jesus, Leash Hurland has gone back mm. thirty years here. They're not even we're not yeah. even going to see them in the Leinster Championship again for 10, 15 years. And to stay up in both Division One and in the All Ireland Championship, given where they started, and then running Waterford, leading Waterford with five minutes to go in a knockout game in the Championship, is an unbelievable turnaround and just deserves a bit of credit. Like, absolutely, Mike, I agree totally with you. I went to see, I was at a couple of their league games and um, just doing on on uh, on the radio for them, and I was seriously worried about them in the Championship because they were they were just they were shipping massive scores. I think they conceded the most in the league, even more than than the West Westmead did. Like you know and it was constant, constant, heavy beatings, heavy defeats. But then you look back at it and they never really had their strongest team out in any mm. of the league matches due to injury or lads weren't back or, you know, maybe Cheddar was holding lads in reserve and, you know, wanted them fresh for the championship. Then they go and play Wexford, play 13 men behind the ball, basically most times, two sweepers almost, ship 531. And for me, from talking to Leash people, after that game, I think there was just a decision to say, look, we have to go for this. We can't be defensive. And I was at the Antrim match and, and they went for it. And they played 15 and 15, and they were absolutely brilliant. Scored 227 that day, went down to 13 men. And while they were down to 13 men, scored three points. So yeah. that just shows you the character that was in the team. Then you then you go on and you know they put in an absolutely brilliant display against Watford. And coming into the 64, 62nd minute, they're a point up. Mm. And you know, and, and why? Because they went at it. They went 15 and 15. They went for it. They, they weren't sitting back inviting teams onto them. They said, look, we've good enough for the field to challenge anyone. And I think people stood up and respected them. And then when you see what Watford did the weekend, I think people respect them even a bit more. And then, the, and then at Westmead the other day, and Westmead, absolutely brilliant display, I suppose. If there's a team of the week being picked this week, Niall O'Brien from Westmead has to be in it. Seven points from play, absolutely exceptional mm-hmm. stuff. But like just, just, just looking back at, at uh, the game there, you know, streaming it and stuff, like down six points coming into the second water break leash. And I think, you know... Tactical tactics and everything kind of goes out the window for me, Mike, at, at that stage. And you just kind of look at the characters in your team and you look at the leaders you have. And Cheddar looks at them and says, "Lads, I just need you to do this now." And by God, they did like absolutely, you know. And they they, they went on, they won the game, one twenty seven to twenty seven points. Westmead missed the penalty at the end, and um, it was driven over the bar. You know, also had Aaron Craig red red card just for half time. These are all factors. But look, all that's been said with the league that Leash had. I don't think many people could foresee the performances they put in in the championship. They stayed up in the league. And I think while the start of the year was a disaster in the Wexford game, I think it's been an absolutely brilliant end of the year for Cheddar Plunkett and all his men. You know, they're in Division One hurling. They're in the Lee McCarthy next year. They'll build on it. And you know what? I, I was just talking on Twitter the other day. 
you talk about all star nominations, I know you have your role in all stars. I mean, for me, there's guys like PJ Scully, 17 points the other day, mm-hmm. Paddy Purcell, Jack Kelly, Ender Roland. These are all guys who uh, I think should be in with a shout, but you know, unfortunately, the thing gets weighted, I suppose, the further on you go, Mike, as, as, as you know well, you know. But I think yeah. these guys are, are, are definitely in contention for some of the some of the best hurlers in the country at the moment. Yeah, and that's why we do the Rolling All Stars, actually. We give Darren a chance to pick one, so we might give, give you a chance to sort of uh, have a look at um, at last week's team and uh, and see who you might want to add in. We have got Paddy Purcell in there after his performance against Waterford and all the way through the year, uh, and the idea is to kind of make sure that the early rounds aren't too forgotten, so we pick a team every week. People have to stay in or get people out. Is there anyone there that you think uh, has... Um, the either deserves to keep their place or someone that should come in after uh, the the jo- before the jury gets together tomorrow yeah I, su- I suppose for me like rory rory hayes has to stay anyway for for now i thought i think he's been absolutely outstanding i think uh, i think sean o'donoghue might come in might come into into the conversation uh it's interesting to see that uh, in the full back line right now i think i think you'll see big changes there i think carl barrett and sean finn will have a massive say in how that full back line goes uh, out around midfield, then yeah, I think Carl Malone has been absolutely brilliant. I think he might he might come up one match short, maybe for actually do, actually getting into the overall team, Mike. In my opinion, but with, with with the performances that are going on and with the form that Jamie Barron is in at the moment, so he'll mm-hmm. probably feature in your team if he continues with his performances up front. Then you know, yeah, it's hard it's hard to argue with uh, with, with with many of those. Uh, I suppose I don't see I don't see Tony Kelly there, so he'll be he in. might be he <laughs> might be he might be one that slips back in. Again, whether whether he holds on for me won't be dependent on Tony Kelly's performances, Mike. It'll be dependent yeah. on how good the other six forwards, other five forwards, uh, and the teams that are left in it go for the rest of the year. So, look, I, I I always love these things. I think the debates about them are great, and uh, you'll never keep everyone happy with them. And even when the All Star teams are picked, we'll all have two or three that will have a difference in opinion. So, look, I think I think they're a great idea, and I think they yeah. absolutely Paddy Purcell uh, definitely definitely should be in there as well. Yeah. In case you ever think I'm biased, I uh, I literally nearly stormed out of our virtual room uh, when we weren't allowed to put Jason Ford on after getting eight points from playing one half of a Munster final. Uh, yeah. You know, despite despite you know a, a, a pro Clare man means a natural anti tip bias, you know. But even still, that's how yeah. good Jason Ford was. That's it, exactly. um, yeah, 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 exactly. So we'll, yeah. See, we'll see what happens, but uh, TK uh, to get in anyway is is the main choice there. But definitely a few to keep as well that we've we've uh, kept an eye on. The panel will keep an eye on it. Shane, thanks a million for joining us. It's been an unbelievable um, year of hurling so far. It just keeps coming. It's hectic. We'll miss it when it's gone, but we'll enjoy it while it's there. Absolutely. Absolutely, Mike. Yeah, looking forward to another bit of excitement next week. And as I say, keep we'll, we'll keep the interest up in the skateboarding as well in the Olympics just to see if we <laughs> any any Irish hopefuls in the future. Definitely. It was all about the badminton this morning anyway. We were watching that as well. So thanks a million, Shane. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, talk to you next week. Um, yeah, if you're enjoying the show, please uh, do subscribe. We still have uh, loads more to come. Please subscribe, be it on YouTube or on the podcast, and leave us a rating as well. Uh, don't forget to get involved in the comments as well um, if you want to be part of the discussion. Now, before we go, uh, we're going to guess the handicaps with um, with Gary and PJ, who are standing by. But before we get to that, our man Finch has been bringing us through all the important uh, conversation points in the GEA. We've had the best moustaches, we've had the best hurling helmets, lots more beside the best jerseys of the, the best away jerseys of the 2021 year, which was one of our more niche ones. But now we're going to look at something that's close to everybody's heart, which is the best sponsored jersey combinations in GEA history. The advent of jersey sponsorship. Some sponsors have just worked better than others. Sometimes it's down to the success a county's had, but other times it's just down to sheer aesthetics. So what we're going to do today is run you through the best jersey sponsors in GAA history. Next to come, we might actually see AIG as the quintessential dub sponsor, but Arnott's in Dublin was just a beautiful collaboration. Is there anything more Galway than Supermax? Alright, maybe white lads with dreadlocks, but Supermax comes very, very close, okay? Cork have had a few iconic sponsorships. Think ESAT Digiphone and the success they had at O2, but Barry's T just, it works, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Avonmore and Kilkenny is just a collaboration that will never end. Brian Cody will never leave his position as manager, and Kilkenny will never stop winning. The reason Keepak are on this list is just purely down to what Mead did while they were sponsored by the brand. This is Sean Boylan's Mead, so it's gotta be iconic. Uh, it's fairly simple, isn't it? Kerry, Kerry Group. And it's been like that 
since the dawn of time and it won't ever change. Gain feeds, feeds animals. I mean, it's not even down to what the company does, but just seeing gain huge on a jersey instills fear into an animal. I might have an inherent bias because I'm called Finch, but there is no more refreshing orange drink than Finch's and Tip rocked a sponsor back in the day. It could be Carol's Meats, it could be Carol's Cuisine, it could be any variation on a theme. You see that sponsor and you immediately know that off they are coming. Is it Tegral? Is it Tegral? Either way, the company isn't even called that anymore. It's called Cedral. But it was absolutely integral when Kildare were reaching all Ireland semis. Okay, it is time to guess the handicap. Gary and PJ are standing by. I don't know what Pat O'Donnell has to do to get on the list, lads. He's been sponsored there for 150 years. They've won three All Irelands in that time. Come on. <laughs> Gary, you're pissed yeah. off. I know didn't get the nod. Yeah, gravel arms for me. Gravel yeah, arms. All the way. 100%. The glory days, back to the glory days of Westmead football. So, so like, raging is not on the list. The, uh, with the, the, the Kerry one, I believe that. That Kerry Group logo didn't exist until they had to put like a sponsor on the jersey, because otherwise it just I presume, it would just be Kerry. You wouldn't know you're sponsored by Kerry Group. <laughs> that is actually true. Yeah, I've heard that recently as well. Yeah, there was no need for them to be called anything but Kerry until they just were kind of just Kerry written on the jersey, which I think would have been great in its own way as well. But I don't know if it would have done much good for the makers of Kerry Gold and whatever else that they do. Um, Okay, so guess the handicaps. Gary is the champ again, which is nothing new, but he did regain it from PJ last week. We've got four games. I have a tiebreaker, um, if needs be, but I hope it doesn't get to that because I've lost my notes where uh, that, that <laughs> details are. I will find them, though. I, I do actually know where they are, but it won't make great video. Um, so we'll see how we go. Gary, you're in the lead, so you get the choice of, of whether to go for, or You're the champ, so you get choice of where to go first. And that's the first time I've been consistent in that all year. <laughs> I remember. Uh, I I think I, I work going second worked for me last time, so I think I'll let PJ go first this time again. Okay, PJ. Well, the order I have, which uh, Shane's going to have to listen to because I forgot to tell him what it was. I'm going with the hurling first, and we're going to start with uh, Tip and Waterford, the game we were just talking about with Shane. Uh, there, um, a game that I don't think Tipperary fans will be too confident with after Waterford's performance at the weekend, PJ. No, definitely not. What, what Waterford were that first half? They were um, they were incredible. I heard it. Liam, Liam Cal said it was uh, that was an even better performance than their comeback against Kilkenny in the All Ireland semi final. Mm. Which and that was a that was a superb game, super, superb performance. From what like Waterford, they were up by what twelve points at the break. They had, they had eleven, they had nine scores scorers in the first half, eleven overall. Um, like I, I think, like Shane McGrath said, um, going down to fourteen men in the second half, kind of. Definitely, definitely told in the end. Um, I'm really, I, I, I really looking forward to this game. Like it, it's, a, it's such, it's a very hard one to call to. Mm -hmm. I think like Waterford being out, this is their third week in a row. Probably will, I think it will be a factor. Whereas Tip have had a fortnight off now. I, yeah, if and like if you see the Tip where we saw in that first half against Limerick, this, this, this I, it's going to be a magnificent game. Um, I think Tipperary will be favourites. I say tip point of two. I was surprised that Shane sat there. I don't know why, how I didn't know it that 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 uh, Waterford have a tip of such an Indian sign over Waterford. They haven't beaten them since two, they haven't lost them since two thousand eight. I don't know an umpire's uh, an umpire's uh, bad eye for uh, Austin Gleeson's catch on the line that time might have had something to do with that. Mm. Uh, but in fairness, it's been a very very good record. They played a lot of times in that time. Gary, what do you think? T yeah. uh, Number PJ minus PJ minus two, tip minus two. Yeah, well, we've talked about every week. It seems like would you rather have the rest or would you rather have the games under the belt? I suppose for tip, they were kind of coming off a where as good as they were in the first half. Like PJ said, they're that second half against Limerick and the ones to find it's just like, will they be able to bounce straight back from that? You'd, I think I'd still fancy them to beat Waterford as good as Waterford were again the last day. Um, Minus two sounds about right, but I'll go minus three because I think it's just more likely than minus one. 
You're fighting a losing battle there from day one. It is, in fact, hit minus two. Uh, decided not to cut you off on the first one, considering we got <laughs> more of these, but uh, I, I, re I retain the uh, option of doing that later on. But, Gary, you're going first now for Cork and Dublin. Uh, I don't know. I know they've played a few times in the qualifier since, but I always just think the 2013 All-Ireland final for that was the only time I've ever been at Crow Park for a Dublin match that felt like a Dublin football match. You know, Hill 16 was completely full. There were 65,000 people there, and it was an absolute brilliant match, and Cork just death by a thousand cuts once Ryan O'Dwyer got sent off. They just point after point after point, but they, Dublin should have won the game. It would have been a historic All-Ireland final appearance for them, but what, what was the year Shane said that they haven't beaten them since 1927? 2008, I think he said. 2007 or 8. Oh, no, but uh, that, that Dublin haven't beaten Cork in the championship. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I've, yeah. I've, I've messed up altogether there. 20, 20, 20s. It was 20s anyway. I think it was 27, yeah. So, Gary, what do you reckon here? What's the handicap? Oh, uh, Jesus, that's some record. I can't believe that, but... Uh, but they would have hardly yeah. ever played, I suppose. Like, I mean, they true, were true, had the opportunity yeah. to until a few years ago. That's true, yeah. Uh, Dublin, like, coming, you, you kind of felt sorry for them in the Leinster final just because, you know, they were coming in off to, off a big win over Galway. You know, people were like, oh, Kilkenny are going well, but maybe Dublin gives them a game. And then they just got landed with that COVID and yeah. slash injury issues literally right before the game, losing another player down within a couple of minutes. So it's kind of hard to get a read on them. I don't know what the situation is with those lads coming back. Is it too soon for them or not? But um, for Cork, like, they were... They were deserved, like you were saying earlier, Mick, they deserved to win at the weekend, but very close. They were very close to not. So uh, I think I think Cork will be favourites. Minus three for Cork, I'd say, maybe. Okay, PJ. Yeah. If the, the, the getting those players back is like a big factor here for Dublin, I think, because like, you know, like uh, Keanu Callan, like re really important in full back. Like, I'm talking about like the players who were... Uh, because of being close contact because of COVID 19, like in Roran Hayes, like really good in the full forward line as well this year. Mm. Um, like actually, you know, Ryan like, set up the a big goal in the in the um in the Galway game as well. The the crummy goal, like he comes on in every match as well. Like, do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not, it was like for me, they lost four real players, like not you know, four big players, like over the and yeah. um, Donald gone after two minutes. It was just oh. Uh, Nightmare. Yeah, it's a like what Owen O'Donnell is probably the biggest of all of those. Like he, you're yeah. looking at he probably like he was gone so early. He probably shouldn't have started that game against Kilkenny. Mm -hmm. uh, but like this Cork team are like you can see that goals is, is such a big thing for them because like late uh, the Shane Barrett's goal like against Clare, you can see like James Harney could have taken a, an easy point there, but he spotted the pass for Shane Barrett and took a goal. Um, if Ona Don isn't in the that, that full back line for Dublin, you think like those car forwards are going to be licking their lips, like O'Connor Kingston. Um, I think Gary has probably gone a little bit low here, so I'm going to say Cork minus four. And finally, I get to talk about a pretty big talking point this week that I wasn't I, I wasn't able to bring up with the lads. It is Cork minus six. And I'd be, I, I have to say, there's a part of me that's absolutely outraged about this. And I, was, I wanted to talk to Shane about it, but I couldn't ruin the segment. Cork minus six, lads. Where, where, where is the four <laughs> minus this? Like? Yeah, I, like, like there is a lot of, in things like this, there is history taken into yeah. account. Because right. when, when buddies are forming these lines, they, you know, they, they, they take into account that well, people are just going to presume that Cork are going to win this game, yeah. and they're going to back Cork. So that probably is factored into this. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right there. I don't, like weirdly enough, it would also worry me that even a close game, Cork could end up winning by more than six because of their penchant for scoring goals this year. You know, so but at the same time, I just think as a number, it's like I would be so insulted. As a double player, look like that. I'm sure they're not too worried about it. I don't know if we're putting it up, but it, again, we all every week we have one dressing room wall number, and I think that this is it this week. Uh, not to give anything away for the other ones, but let's move on to the football anyway, lads, because the two the Ulster and Leinster finals um, on this weekend. I don't know. Um, the let's start with the Ulster final. Easily the best province uh, by a mile every year in terms of competitiveness, but this year in terms of football as well. Um, PJ, you're up first here. Tyrone and Monaghan, like, I don't know. There's just so much at play here with this one. Yeah, it's a, like, like it's, it's a novel enough final. Like, two, 2010 is the last time these two teams 
met in the, the Ulster Decider. Um, yeah. Monaghan haven't won since 2015, Tyrone since 2017. Like when you look at the list of Ulster finals over the last 11 years, there are only two times that Donegal haven't been in the game. Which yeah, is, well, yeah. It, it, it is an incredible record, really. And they're always just, against either Tyrone or Monaghan, so it doesn't yeah. feel like it's, uh, <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's a novel bearing. Yeah. No. Um, it's just this game here, Crow Park as well, of course. That's yeah. something to think about. I where think. it was, where when um, Sean Cavanagh pulled down Conor McManus mm. all those years ago. Yeah, yeah. God, I, hadn't th- I, I, had, I had not thought about that. Um, I have a feeling Tyrone are going to be favourites here. I think Tyrone will be favourites like that. I don't, they, they, they definitely have that Crow Park experience. There's a lot of, there are a lot of young, Monaghan bought through like, there was a lot of younger players early on in the year. It, 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 it's kind of like, it's a pretty good mix of youth and experience now. But I think Tyrone probably have a Crow Park factor will probably tell a little bit, or will be a factor at least. Uh, I think Tyrone will be favourites. Go ahead, Tyrone minus two. Mm. It's been an emotional couple of weeks for Monaghan, and uh, you know I think their performance against Armagh was just electric at times. But they did let them back into the game. You'd wonder if Tyrone got that chance, would they put them away? You know, um, what do you think, Gary? I think I'm regretting my decision to go second because Pete is picking what I would have picked every time and <laughs> getting them right. Because uh, I definitely would have said minus two. Like I think Tyrone will be favourites. Minus three seems like a lot for an Ulster final. So, but I go minus one. Mm, I know. Tarot minus three. Why not? I go for that. Oh, he went the wrong way. We have a new champion. Ah, no. Tarot minus one. <laughs> Monaghan getting more credit than uh, from, from the bookies than from both of you. Uh, look, can't wait for that game. It's going to be great to... The all red against the all blue, two strange strips as always. Dublin Kildare is another familiar uh, clash of jerseys and used to be a brilliant game to look forward to, uh, less so in the last maybe 10 years. Uh, but I don't know, there's a feeling here. Could Kildare beat Dublin? Asked Lee Fleming on YouTube earlier on. Um, no, is probably the answer. <laughs> but I feel like it's, 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 I feel like we've, we've uh, with Jack O'Connor there, all that kind of stuff, and Dublin just not been at their best. We're probably going to watch for 20 minutes with a bit more intrigue than we have in recent years, Gary. Yeah, like people are kind of saying, oh, you know, Dublin haven't been great. Can there, could they? It's like, no, but can there shouldn't be in this final? I, I'm not coming across as bitter here, but Westmead should have beat them last time. You know, <laughs> they missed. So many chances. They kicked about 40 wides in the game. Gave away two scrappy goals right at the start. <laughs> they gave away two scrappy goals right at the start of the second half and still should have bet them. Like so I think uh I think Dub- like unless Kildare they're so open at the back, I think Dublin could make hay here, like we have seen them do in Leinster about how many times in the last decade. So uh, what's the handicap gonna be? I think it's not gonna be the extreme numbers that we've seen, obviously earlier in the championship um but i think dublin will beat it i have a feeling if it's not really high so i'm gonna say dublin minus 10. okay pj the the opportunity for a whitewash is on (laughs) uh i can they're missing a couple of big players for like that they're they're probably going to be missing kevin feely yeah who is like an incredible fielder of the ball and really it's like a he's got a very good athlete as well he's the kind of player you could think would like stick with um like brian fenton uh paul cribben broke his leg earlier in the year too another big loss daniel finn is fit which is like uh there have been doubts about his fitness going into the west me game and he definitely looked fit in that game uh so like what claire's first final since leinster finals is 2017 like really Kildare should be like they, they should they, they have the talent to be doing far better and I think they will in the future like they won another they won another 20 championship uh three years ago now and a lot of those players are coming true the players like Jimmy Highland and as a Brian McLaughlin in the full forward line um that Dublin win against against Mead was like their what lowest since 20 lowest win like the, the win against uh Wexford was their smallest margin of victory in in Leinster since 2013 and then Mead was like that was eight points and Mead only lost by six points uh I, I do think a factor here is Dublin haven't didn't have their proper full what you would think as their proper starting full back line back yet 
So that'd be like Mark and John Small and Robbie McDade. You know, Robbie McDade, who uh, came out of nowhere at the age of what twenty six or twenty seven last year to be like a, the super player. Mm. Um, I think Gary's probably gone like a little bit too high here. Uh, I got to say Dublin minus nine. <laughs> I actually I said you had a chance to steal, but Gary had a very good guess. And you've stolen it. Ah. It is Dublin minus nine. What a way to complete a four nil victory. No need for the time breaker with the last notes. PJ dominant <laughs> here. Uh, Gary, you have a lot of work to do next week. I mean, yeah. I know you've won more than PJ, but like so it's like Galway going off now for this for the winter to try and come back from this. You've only got one week to try and come back from a four nil whitewash in guess that. That was uh, that was an absolute disgrace all around, I think, really. I bottomed it. No no excuses. <laughs> well, Fair play to PJ, who should get some credit. Again, like like Waterford, deserving credit, not just at all being about Gary slash Galway's collapse. Um, in the, PJ is our champion. We'll be back with more guests the Handicaps next week. We'll have more from Darren and from Shane as well. Um, we'll be a bit later with you next week. It'll be probably more of a preview show than anything else with the bank holiday and a few other things going on. We'll be back with GA Embedded then. If you've enjoyed the show, please do subscribe on uh, YouTube or on the podcast or wherever you're watching. And please get involved in the comments as well with ratings and so on and so forth. We'll talk to you next week.